love your work. On this show, we meet people who have carved out success by their own definition. I'm David Cadavy, best-selling author and entrepreneur. Today's guest is Nick Gray, founder of Museum Hack. Museum Hack makes super fun museum tours such as the Unhighlights Tour, the Badass Bitches Tour, and the Big Gay Met. You've heard in previous episodes, such as Transform Stuff into Things, that I think the world moves forward when someone explores the hidden sources of value that are out there and then gives them form. And I've always found Nick to be great at doing just that, not only with Museum Hack, but also with everyday things like sharing an inventive Facebook birthday greeting or throwing a very rapid but worthwhile cocktail party. We explore this tendency for extracting hidden value in our conversation in the context of upgrading your social life, using virtual assistants to take care of email while going for a walk, or just getting yourself to read more books. This will also be a useful discussion for anyone who has struggled with whether to turn a hobby into a business or anyone who has felt the discomfort of charging money for something they enjoy doing. Here we go. This episode is brought to you by Treehouse. Take your career to the next level and learn from over 1,000 videos created by expert teachers on web design, coding, business, and much more. Claim your free 14-day free trial at cadavy.net slash treehouse. You'll be supporting the show. I am here with Nick Gray of Museum Hack. And my first question, Nick, is how do you hack a museum? <laughs> if you're listening to this podcast and you're like, I hate museums, then you are the person that I made my business for. Uh, how do we hack a museum? We think about hacking. The true word of a hack, and you probably know this, is to know a system so well, right, that you can like reinterpret it and reorganize it to better suit your needs. So anyhow, we do tours that are really fucking fun, that are like the most fun you ever have at a museum. By the way, I love that definition of hack because I get so much, uh, I get so many mixed emotions when I tell people I wrote a book called Design for Hackers. I get so many mixed reactions. People often like, hackers? What do you mean? What do you mean by hackers? I just need to right. write down and memorize exactly what you just said That is to, to really understand something. Okay, so... Um, so you make museums fun, basically. That's our goal, is to reimagine the adult museum experience, to, to try to make tours that serve adults who want the physical version of Wikipedia, which I think museums kind of are or can be, and to do live experiences around that. And how might, if somebody goes to a museum hack uh, experience, how might that experience differ from a, a normal experience or another museum tour yeah from well i'll just start with the museum tour because if you're still listening to this podcast thank you very much for bearing through look i am not like an art person i'm not a museum guy or i don't come from it but i am like the average guy who didn't grow up going to museums but had this amazing experience and wanted to you know share that kind of with others so how do we hack a museum? What do you notice? The first thing is that our tour guides are insanely amazing. We hire Broadway actors and scientists, musicians. It's not like the regular, I don't know, I don't want to say poorly, but it's not volunteers. We pay them really well and we hire the best people to give amazingly so, I don't know, small group engaging tours. That's what we do. Sorry, I'm blabbering. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it, it makes a lot of sense that the world has changed so much and people's preferences have changed so much and their expectations from what they do for entertainment have changed so much. But museums largely are, are have stayed the same. So it's like you're occupying this this little space that is in the ether that, to, to help bridge that gap between... Dude. Yeah. 100,000%, right? Museums have been, first, important to know that museums are, you know, relatively a modern invention. They are something new. And so 
but they also haven't changed a whole lot, right? Over the last hundred years, they haven't really changed. And today, visitors are, they have ADD like me, right? I'm on my phone every two to three minutes. I want interaction. I want entertainment. And that's what our guides do. The tours really are like edutainment of sorts. And they're just very, very fast paced. You hear like how excited I am speaking now that like our guides are way more excited than I am. Wow, that, that's great. I mean, I think that yeah, often on a museum tour, they might kind of give you the facts. Or I always find that with the placards that I read, that I just kind of yeah. get the facts, and I'm like, I want to know something juicy. Like I know, in some cases, it, I I study a little bit of art history, so in some cases I know some juicy stuff behind a painting. And I'm like, how come there, there's no there's no mention of this? Hell yes, I love those juicy details, those gossip behind the scenes. Fun fact for you. The placard that you mentioned, you may know this already. Yeah. In museum pro speak, I've heard the word for that, if you want to sound cool, is a chat, C-H-A-T. C-H-A-T, like a, a chat, like kind yep. of like we're chatting right now. Yeah. I've never heard that before. I, don't I think. know. I think, it's, I think it's a museum slang thing. So if you'd be like, oh, that's yeah. the chat, also known as the placard. Oh, well, they should make it a little more chatty like sometimes it's sometimes it's a little boring it you know, I don't can really definitely be a lot boring. so what was how did you end up starting this museum hack then what was the genesis of this it's a, a crazy story that is 100 percent true a woman took me on a romantic date to the metropolitan museum of art and i didn't really like museums i should backtrack and say that I come from the business and entrepreneurship world. Um, I started a web hosting business in high school. I worked at the time for my family business that sold aircraft electronic equipment like that, uh, that map that shows you where the plane is flying across the world. You know, when you're flying a plane. Yeah. Right. Oh, well, oh, or actually you see it on the, on the back, on the, the back of the headrest in front of you. Right. Back of the headdress. That that's, yeah, yeah, okay. that's the one that we made for small jets and military planes. Anyhow, I did that during the week, but this woman brought me to the Metropolitan Museum of Art on a romantic date, and I was like, holy shit, this place is so cool. I think I moved to New York City for stuff like this, for this museum, these things. Um, and then I just started going there all the time. Every weekend, I was just like, God, I'd have like a glass or two of wine beforehand. And I'd just go and like unwind and walk around, look things up on Wikipedia, and then start to do tours for my friends. Yeah. So you had been to museums before. What was different about this experience that uh, hit that nerve in you? Uh, great question. I think this time it was that it was at night. At the museum, there was like nobody there. The Mets open late on Friday and Saturday nights. A lot of museums are open late, actually. Oh, uh, yeah. So there was nobody there. Uh, probably the fact that like my private tour guide was a very attractive woman. Like sure. that certainly helped me to be a little more interested. And I guess just feeling a sense of ownership over the physical space, right? Nobody's there. It's she and I. We're goofing around. I see these objects and it just... It sounds it sounds silly, but it really unlocked a sense of curiosity about just history and stuff. Yeah, do you remember any particular piece that you saw or tidbit that you heard that created that that rush in you? She took me to this room. Some museums have these rooms that are called period rooms that are entire reconstructions of like exactly how the room looked like a hundred or three hundred years ago. And there was one room that she took me to that featured Rococo furniture and designs. Rococo, by the way, is just a fancy French word that means gold swirly shit. Um, yeah, the Rococo stuff is like a lot of excess ornamentation and such, right? Extremely excess ornamentation. But we went to this room and it's like dark and we go into this period room and it's just opulent and gold and there's like a harpsichord and it just looked like the coolest room that I'd ever been in. 
And I wanted to like have meetings in this room with my friends and drink tea and work on my MacBook Air. And it just felt like really cool. And I was like, oh, this is dope. Yeah, that that sounds like a really powerful moment. And I, I'm, I want to dig even deeper into that. Uh, was there, I mean, can you tie back your reaction to that, that, that sort of love or passion that you felt when you entered that room to anything else that you've experienced in your life? I like that spaces. would explain why you liked it so much. <laughs> I like spaces. As long as I can remember, I've liked to explore spaces that maybe I feel like I'm not supposed to be in. Um, I remember in high school, I found this grocery store that had closed down. We found like a back door that was unlocked and we explored. It just felt so cool to have to be in that space. Um, and in New York City, it's oftentimes hard to, I mean, you're, it's crowded, right? It's a rat where there's, there's just millions of people and it's so crowded. It was in this space that I found this like peace and tranquility and just a real, just hundreds of years old, this connection to history that I don't get when my face is in my phone on my Twitter and Facebook and stuff. This was, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's it, interesting that you have that curiosity about certain spaces but you know in an abstract way you're exploring this space between the uh the viewer of a museum and the usual museum experience and you're kind of digging in there and creating this you're you're in this little space that that isn't that hasn't been explored do you, do you am i making sense yeah 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 look my my whole thing, yeah, you're making total sense. My whole thing is to have the most fun at museums like as I possibly can have because I think that these days museum donors and everything, right, like membership is dying out. They're, they're quite literally dying out. And the funding sources for these arts institutions are not, not coming from where they used to come. And people today in this high-attention economy – associate museums with being very boring. I mean, not, not everybody feels that way, but all my friends do. And so that's all that we try to do. Like, let's just have fun first. First and foremost, let's have fun. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the education can come afterwards. We think that today's audiences have to be entertained before they can be educated. Yeah. And so you have this transcendent experience at the Met, right? The Met? The Metropolitan Museum of Met Art. Best. Yeah, yeah, the Met. And then in, at that time, you were during the day working with these uh, airplane uh, displays. Yeah. What, what happened to, to make it so that today you are dedicated to this museum hack thing? I started to do these tours every weekend for my friends, and I wanted to be like the best tour guide in the world. I used to think I wanted to do tours for celebrities. I did a couple of those. That was really fun. Um, but my tours became very, very popular. And it was all like underground and secret. And then one day a blog wrote about our tours. And so it like busted the lid off the cover. And the next day, a thousand people emailed me wanting wow. to join one of these tours, which was pretty crazy. So I started to recruit my friends to help me out. They started to do tours too. Yeah, just became a thing. Eventually, we started to charge for the tours, which was like really stressful. So and you weren't charging for the tours at first. You were just doing them for fun with your friends and friends of friends. How was exactly. all that spreading? Yeah, super fun. Friends would tell their friends. It was super informal and casual. We ran a tight game, but it also was free. It was just something fun to do for my friends and friends of friends. And were you putting a lot of time into research or, or how were you putting together the tour? Itself? I would not necessarily say that I personally put a lot of time into research. My colleagues today who work for me, we have like 25 employees. They do a lot of research and their tours are amazing. But my tours at the beginning were, were basically the theme of my tours was like 10 cool things I found and three things that I want to steal. So not ultra sophisticated. 
Well, I mean, th that says a lot about the way people were, re were reacting to it. If you were saying that that you weren't that you hadn't done a lot of uh, research, but people were still reacting in that way to actually come to the museum and and go on your tour, and then now they're even better because there's all that research going on. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There, the the tours are way better now, but we still focus on fun first and foremost. So what was the moment like when you decided that you were going to start charging, try to make something out of this? Very stressful. I didn't want to do it. It's like turning a, like a hobby, a baby into a business. Yeah, I really fretted about it for a long time. And so how did you reconcile that? <sighs> um... I would compare it to having to like dating somebody new and avoiding that DTR, you know, DTR, like a define the relationship talk. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Where you have that talk and you're like, what are we? And those talks can go one of two ways. And for me, the DTR, the define the relationship of me doing these tours I said, look, I want to get serious about this. I want this to be bigger than just me. And to do that, I need to charge. I need to be able to hire somebody who can run these so that it's not entirely reliant on me as a hobby. So it's a hard, hard thing to do. Ultimately, stuff shifts, right? Obviously, things change when you start to charge for something that was free and and it was very stressful, but I'm so happy we did it. I'm so happy we did it. I cannot even imagine if we didn't do it. Yeah. What were the elements uh, of it that were causing you stress? When you don't charge for something, you, as the provider, can have very low expectations for the product that you have to deliver. So for me to do a free tour for my friends and just be like, you know what? So I'm going to have two glasses of wine before the tour and I'm just going to show up and just have fun and hang out with you guys. I'm going to show you like my favorite stuff. Um, like that's acceptable and that's okay when it's a free tour. Okay. Uh, when it's a paid tour, people have higher expectations. Like they justifiably are paying for a product and I can't have an off day. It's not acceptable for me to be late I can't, you know, not dress on top of my tees. I got to have like all the logistics locked down. It just becomes very serious. And I was so worried that it would like suck all the fun out of it. And that was my biggest holdup. Yeah, I, that's something I've experienced myself. I think when I personally will avoid uh, committing to any sort of goal or, or something like that, just because I know that once I do that, then my standards of of quality are going to come into play and then and then suddenly i'm i'm on the hook it's like it's like i'm a worm that is is writhing and squiggling to avoid getting put on the hook right and then and then once i'm on the hook then you know that then the, the commitment's done now i've got to got to do these things it's a little bit a little bit like that you're committed once you're on that hook uh when we're talking right now, right now it's the end of January. It's the same reason that I haven't publicly announced my New Year's resolutions because, you know, of course I'm working on stuff, but I'm not not necessarily talking about them. I want to have those down and handled. I, you might be a little bit like me where, I mean, I, I'm somebody who, if I make a certain commitment, then then it's happening. But I will avoid, I will put off making that that sort of commitment or that goal. I mean, I can think of a perfect example was, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with the uh, Insanity workout program. I might've talked to you about it before. I don't know about it, but it sounds amazing. It's 60 days and it's this plyometrics. It's six days a week for 62 days or something. And it's a crazy workout. And I remember uh, a friend convinced me to do it. And he was like, come on, let's do this, this workout program. Like, I don't know. I'm not really like, that type of person it's like all you know overachiever like and so we started we did a couple workouts and then he was like hey let's let's put it on the calendar and then like once we put the workouts on the calendar i was i was in i i finished the whole program and and everything and actually that was like a 
an interesting experience because it made me realize that I sometimes avoid putting myself on the hook and that once I do get on the hook that certain powerful things can come from it. Was there anything that you discovered? I mean, were there any surprises about uh, getting over that resistance and oh. making that commitment? Yo, big time, big time. You know, the biggest surprise was that once we started to charge for it, people actually liked the tour better. People were like more willing to sign up when we were charging for it because they thought that because it was free, that it was going to be very bad or low quality or there was like some sort of a catch. It was a lot harder for us to get new people when it was free now that I think about it. And I could not believe that. Ramit actually told me about that, about like how you raise the price and stuff and how people really value it. And I found that was spot on. Yeah, once you increase that commitment, people and then people have to get in over their own threshold of commitment. If it's free, then maybe they don't feel so bad about not showing up on time or mm -hmm. not really paying attention during it or something. But then when you charge for it, they have to internally get over their own uh, worm on the hook situation where, all right, do I want to pay this? Do I not? And then once they get over that, then there's, then, the, then that's when the, the, uh, sort of cognitive dissonance comes into play of, all right, I paid for this, right. so I must like it. Right. Otherwise I'm, my self perception is going to, is going to be harmed in some way. Yep. Um, so, so yeah, that that's, so people actually enjoyed it more and then you had money coming in. Yeah, people enjoyed it, and we started to make a business. And what was the moment like or, or the day like when you decided, I'm done with this uh, aviation display thing, and I'm going to do this museum thing full time? That was a difficult decision. I'd worked, like any massive life decision, there's never... At least I feel like for most of my big life decisions, there's never been one straw that like breaks the camel's back. And so me leaving our family business was a larger, more complicated story. But I think it really was that one weekend where the blog wrote about us and a thousand people emailed me and suddenly I got this like almost like a fear that's like, wow, we're making something really good right now that entirely depends on me. If something were to happen to me or if I got bored with this and stopped doing it, then like everything would go away. And that that want for this to be much bigger than me was really what caused me to double down on this full time. Wow. OK, so it was this reaction that you had you had clearly struck some sort of a nerve because you know, a thousand people email you and everything. And so you thought to yourself, if I don't do this, then it, this thing isn't going to exist and people, and people want it. Yeah. Yeah. Like I'm not bullshitting. Like this is the best museum tour in the whole world. People were going bananas for it. There was a big waiting list. I mean, it's a, it's a really fun experience and we definitely hit a nerve that people, I don't know. They just wanted to have a fun museum experience. And was there anything about the prospect of pursuing this museum thing that appealed to you in ways that maybe the, the family business of the aviation displays wasn't appealing to you? Dude, it was like night and day difference. The, the, in the museum world, we like go gaga over like $1,000. And at Flight Display Systems, the old family business, you know, we wouldn't even work deals less than like 10 or 20 K. And so it's such a like small time business that I run now. It's not small time. I mean, now we're huge, but it's a much more boutique, direct customer focus, very exciting. Yeah. Was, I don't know what to, what to say about it. If you've ever run a small business, you know, like those first dollars are really nice. And so did that just create sort of a uh, more of an appreciation for the money that was coming in? What was, you know, what was, what helped sway you from, from uh, doing this previous gig to doing this present gig, gig, <laughs> this business? Yeah. I had been working at our family business for years, probably seven years or so. And it was really the only job that I had 
outside of my own companies and startups. And my parents are very supportive and awesome, but also like, you know, you probably should do some other stuff than just work for the business. And so it wasn't, it wasn't like a massive decision or it's like, I hate this company. I'm leaving to do this. It was like everything fell together at the right time. I'm very lucky and thankful to have had this opportunity. And friends were also definitely encouraging me to work on this full time. And you had done entrepreneurial things before. Like you said, you started a hosting business when you were in mm -hmm. high school. Yeah. Yeah. And a cool web hosting resellership. How did that happen? Um, I don't, I was building websites in like middle and high school. This is like 97, 98. And all my web page clients needed web hosting, obviously. And I was buying them all from this one company called Pair Networks, P-A-I-R. I think I remember. Them. Yeah. 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 They were like the, one of the big hosts in the game back in the day. They still have a lot of people now. Um, and so I just signed up as a reseller with them and started to build websites and resell. And then I created a page around it, around reselling their services. And I lucked out, dude, with SEO. I got somehow when I was registering with Yahoo, when you search for cheap web hosting, um, for a couple months, my site was coming up first. And wow. yeah, this is like 98, 99. I got... I don't know, in one week, probably got like 100 new customers. And for some kid in high school in the middle of North Georgia, you know, that was a pretty big deal. How old were you at that time? 17 or so. Yeah. Yeah. I was making like web pages, my own web pages back then, but I didn't, uh, I didn't have any clients. How did, I mean, it's interesting that you were reluctant to charge for the museum hack thing. But you, at you know, 16, 17 years of age, decided, oh, I'm going to start finding clients and charging them to build them web websites. How did you even have the presence of mind to know that that was a thing that you could do? Oh, yeah. Dude, I definitely grew up. Like, it's all about the paper, right? Like, you want to stack money when you don't have money. And I grew up very, yeah, very middle class. I don't know if we were lower middle class or middle class, but, you know, I come from a family of entrepreneurs and every opportunity, right? Like bonding time for me and my dad was we would go out, I think when I was in like middle school and we'd get like little booths at like county fairs and we would sell blue blocker sunglasses together, uh, cash business, very nice. Uh, so that type of attitude of like making a buck and making money selling web pages, uh, was just the way that I funded my baseball card and comic book habit, stuff like that. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I was in a completely different environment. I didn't really know any entrepreneurs. So I, I would have, I would have thought, I guess, um, one of the first thoughts that I might've had would, would have been like, is this, is this even, is this legal for me to do this? Like, okay. <laughs> you know, like that's how little I would have known about this possibility that I could, you know, build web pages for clients and get paid for it. Yeah. But it was just, it was just right there for you. It was, you didn't have any, you didn't have to get over any resistance to get comfortable with that. I don't think so. No, no. I had like other lawn care businesses growing up, things like that. I, yeah, I mowed, I mowed a few lawns as well. Actually, I was, I remember doing this one thing. It was, uh, I, I, if I think about it, I had done some fairly entrepreneurial things for not growing up in an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial, in, entrepreneurial environment. One of the things I did was, uh, it was called Sunshine Sales Club. I don't know if you remember this. It was on the back of uh, 321 Contact Magazine, and it was like, you could... Um, there'd be all these different toys, like a basketball or a skateboard or something. And you'd yeah. go door to door selling like Christmas decorations or various things. And then you would earn points through which you could get the, the various toys. Now that I think of it, it's really shady business. Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I'm just going to get kids to go door to door and then I'm going to give them, give them toys for selling my stuff. And take all of, <laughs> all of the money. <laughs> Whoever invented that is a genius, though. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're probably 
rich. Yeah, they're probably dead by now. Actually, it's it's been it's been a while. But I geeked so you... out a couple of weeks ago. By the way, I geeked out about learning about like multi level marketing companies um, because yeah. this girl I know from high school is like all about one, and she's like a really smart woman. And then and then this other woman I know does social media for this big company out west that does. Actually, I won't say what they do, but but they are just stacking paper. They're just making so much money, and it's pretty interesting. They sell the dream of financial freedom, debt-free living, and entrepreneurship when in reality like 0.1% of people actually make money on it, right? Yeah, but it's still possible. You know, It's still possible right. to make a lot of money. I mean that's, that's the American dream in a nutshell right there. <laughs> I don't know if the American dream is multi-level marketing, but yes, no. to do something, yeah. The, the, the odds of that motivation of like, ah, there's a small chance that I'll become a billionaire makes, right. it, makes you willing to uh, to slog through things. Speaking of which, did you a buy a lot of ticket recently or did you get like all up in the hoopla? I didn't. I mean, I was totally unaware of it. Uh, my my mother messaged me and said, oh, I bought a lotto ticket for us. And, you know, right. so uh, I don't think that we won. Um, there was but, a huge Powerball lottery for anybody that's listening that's not tuned in. It was over a billion dollars. I'm sure you know. I didn't, I didn't buy realize a ticket. that. Wow. Oh yeah, it was ginormous. But the value that like buying that ticket gave so many people the dream. What would I do with that money? That's worth it. Yeah, that, that, that's that's how they had that money to give away with to give away in the first place, I suppose. Right. Um. So. I, I feel like we could just this... talk for the rest of this podcast about how we'd spend a billion dollars, and that might be pretty fun. <laughs> I don't. Need, I don't know what I would do with it. I hardly know. I, I mean, I don't even have that much money now, and I, you know, I've kind of run out of things that I that I want to buy. So, dude, I have nowhere near a billion dollars, but I think you live I in New would. York. I do live in New York. It's so expensive here. You can easily spend a billion dollars. You can spend a billion dollars in an afternoon in New York. You can. When I first moved here to New York, one of my friends told me how some people spend a thousand dollars on date nights, and I was like, "That is freaking ridiculous! How could you spend a thousand dollars on a date?" And then, like a few years later, I was like, Ugh, "All right, I can see how you could spend a thousand dollars on a totally date." Totally possible. Yeah, not, not kind of disgusting, hard. but yeah. Yeah, not like, like I'm definitely not that type of guy, by the way. Like I want to be clear, but I can absolutely see. Which, if you're listening, it's like a couple Broadway tickets, going out to a really nice uh, dinner, some glasses of wine, a car between, uh, serve it like, yeah, stuff like that. Like it adds it's, up. It sounds like a fun night. I mean, if I've got the money, I'll, I'll right, I'll, I'll shell right. it out. But yeah. I, I'm also equally happy uh, doing something less less expensive, I guess. Yeah. Um. I want to dig into this making uh, unique experiences or exploring these sort of hidden spaces. Um, we we met for dinner. Was it dinner or lunch? Uh, a few months back over the summer in uh, in New York, and you showed up with like a sort of a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> on your phone, and you you were like, okay, when did we meet? And I'm like, I, I tried to remember when, and he's like, and you said, no, it was November 2000, right. whatever yeah. the date was. And then you went through the slideshow of what you've, what, I think maybe you had some stuff in there about me, and then you had some stuff in there about what you had been up to, and it was, you had changed this experience of just meeting a friend for dinner into this whole other thing. Um, is that something that you... <laughs> that you do a lot or was that just a little experiment i'm like the worst friend like like what friend do you have that like brings a powerpoint or a keynote <laughs> to a like lunch dinner meeting um i like doing that I, I i learned about doing that from my buddy charles foreman who used to uh um, oh, yeah, i know charles yeah yeah he used to like storyboard stuff out on his ipad and then i started to make them for meetings with friends and things I don't know. I think life is a series of opportunities and each one is a chance to make an experience that's memorable. I don't do it all the time, right? I'm like the same guy that's going to go have lunch at that same restaurant, like with myself, with like headphones in, listening to a Kindle. Um, another 
instance of you creating a, an experience that was a little unusual was I went to one of your your curated cocktail parties, and you know it could part of this could be that it's just a New York thing that I don't understand, but it was the fastest cocktail party I had ever been to. It was I think it was like an hour and a half. And there was a period of time, there was great conversation. There was a period of time when uh, we went around the room and everybody talked a little bit about themselves. And then, uh, and then at the end of it, that the, the end time you, you know, you came up to people and you said, Oh, just you know, politely telling you uh, to leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> get the, yo, get out. It was get out of my apartment, which I loved because I think that it, uh, this is, prevented me whenever i think about entertaining or having people over i think about oh it's going to drag on it's going to take over the whole night and this was a mm. week night that you did this so i see it as anyway i guess first i'll i'll ask you about what your philosophy is behind a cocktail party such as that and is that a new york thing or was is this something unique about the way that you run a cocktail party i think it's definitely a thing that works well in New York, but I don't know anybody. I think it's a me thing that did it like a scheduled, it's like the most formal, informal cocktail party. Here's what, here's what happens. I let people know, look, you can show up at nine o'clock to come have a nightcap, a glass of wine or something, but we will be done at 1030. And so you should show up right at nine. And then like at 1030, I'm going to start to ask you guys to leave. And the reason I do that is because I respect my friend's time and I don't want them to think like, oh, it's going to go on forever. Or like, oh, I'm not going to come because I have an early day tomorrow. And so I run it like Loctite. And you did mention, right, that we go around a circle and we do like, here's what we do. And that is like an icebreaker because the purpose of cocktail parties and networking events is to meet people. And so I want to facilitate as many chances and opportunities for someone to be like, oh, whoa, that person's really into South America or, oh, that guy works in development. That's really interesting. I'm going to go chat. So I always do that circle up. Let's say what you do, something you're passionate about. Yeah. So it gives it gives people an opportunity to chat. And then we we left and then actually a, a few of us went to a place nearby, just a bar nearby and extended the conversation. What? So Nobody invited me to that. What? <laughs> Who did you go out with? Did you guys have fun? Damn. Uh, yeah, it was it was fun. Uh, I I didn't. I gosh, I'm sorry. I didn't think to invite you, Nick. <laughs> Nick I figured that you were too busy cleaning up after your cocktail party after that's your big exactly, bash. Exactly. I guarantee that's exactly what I was doing. I was cleaning up the trash out of my apartment. I'm yeah. glad you guys. Found that. But you were able to. You know, you were done at 10:30, and you were able to have a productive day at work the next day. I'm sure, and it didn't uh, interrupt things too much, and. I think that some people will hold themselves back from have, from entertaining at all because because they don't want to they don't want to tell people to leave their apartment is is a big part of it I think. I think so too. I never thought about that that people are hesitant, but I think if you're listening to this and you want to know the easiest way to upgrade your social life, um, it's to start to host your own events to to put yourself in that position of power. And it's very easy to do. Um, and one example of one that I'll tell you that I haven't done, but I've been wanting to do it is to throw a cocktail party. That's called a Frenaissance. Have you ever heard about this? No, I haven't. Okay. So someone mentioned to me years ago, I just haven't done it, but the Frenaissance is you and like friend renaissance renaissance yeah you reach out to a couple friends from various social groups let's say six people and you tell them look i'm throwing a party i want you to bring somebody that i don't know who you think is like super okay. cool yeah and so then what happens is six people show up to the party that you know six people that you don't know which means all these other people don't know each other so everybody's on the same level playing field and it's just like a cool opportunity to come together and have a drink yeah yeah and so yeah i thought that was really it was kind of inventive i guess and you you got something out of it and um it was sort of overcoming some resistance that it's it's funny that I think a lot of people would be reluctant to have like a 
an abrupt end time and to tell people when they're lingering they might just like mutter to themselves ah oh, people are just like lingering and they don't want to they don't want to tell people right. to leave which if you're yeah. offended when somebody tells you to leave your apartment what's wrong with you right <laughs> but, right right uh, uh yeah that was uh it was it was a great cocktail party i, I loved it so crazy thing i just right. put like a minor plug in for my business companies have been hiring us to actually help them facilitate their cocktail parties. So I did one at this big conference down in Miami and we created like a human bingo game. It was pretty rad. So your next, rad. your next company is going to be cocktail hack. Cocktail hack.com. Please do not register that. I got to <laughs> get that. I got to get it right now. I'll, I'll wait. Okay. Uh, thanks. <laughs> I also remember the first time that we met, there was something that you told me about your approach to reading that changed the, my relationship with books in a, a really lasting way. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you read books? Yes, I would love to talk about it. When we met, was I doing the virtual assistant powered library reservation? You, yeah, you. Uh, that was the, my first encounter with mm -hmm. somebody who actually used fancy hands and I mm -hmm. still to this day use fancy hands a bit. And I had mentioned a couple books and you said, Oh, hold on a second. And then you just typed into fancy hands really quick that, and you said, Oh, they're going to check these books out from the library for me. And they'll all be waiting for me at the library next time I walk by. Yeah. So, uh, great way that I use virtual assistants and just my local library, which massive kudos to the New York, public library, but many cities actually have amazing libraries that you can just request books to be borrowed. So whenever I read or heard about a book or somebody mentioned it, I would put it onto an Amazon wish list, and then occasionally I would queue up Fancy Hands to go and pull everything from my wish list and check it out from the New York City Public Library for me. And that happened sort of automatically. And so I knew that basically whenever I went, walked by the library in my neighborhood, there'd be cool books that I heard about waiting for me to come and check out. And I'd grab those books and I'd keep the physical stack of them out on my table because I realized there was something so much more powerful than the physical representation of the book to remind me about it than just having these books on my Kindle. Yeah, exactly. And so, but I also recall you, one of the powerful things that, you mentioned was that, oh, and I'll just take the stack of books and I'll pick up a book and I'll look at it for a minute or two and then I'll pick up another book and I'll look at it and then yeah. eventually I'll sort of settle in on a book. Is that? I still do that now. That's question? huge for me is to uh, read books like you read magazines, to not be tied to one, to not just try to read one book at a time, to not be afraid. Dude, this is the biggest thing is people start these books and then they think they have to finish it. And now I'm right. a complete 180 on that. If I read a book, I'm reading one right now, I'm probably going to put it to bed tonight. I'm just not not into it after five or six chapters, and I'm not going to feel guilty that I have to finish it. Yeah, I think this is another one of these cases where somebody's uh, fear of doing something, one, something about it that, that, that will make them un uncomfortable. In this case, starting a book and then not finishing it they sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater and then just don't read the books. Yeah. Or... <laughs> I just came up with a new slogan for me, for my strategy of reading books. The slogan is, I'm a quitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's good to, to be comfortable with quitting books, especially, um, and I, this is going to repeat a little bit of, I think, what I heard uh, Naval talk about on the, the Tim Ferriss yes, podcast. I don't exactly. Wanna, I don't wanna, but it was funny because what he mentioned was like, oh my God, I, I wrote an article about that in, in The Observer, but uh, he had he'd put into words some things that I hadn't touched on, which was, or thought about even, which was that we have a habit of info snacks and then couple that with the fact that some of us are afraid of quitting a book. Right. And then you just have a total, just you're not going to read books at all because it, so he inverts it. And this is a lot the, the way that you do it and, and the way that I've learned to do it, which is to reduce the resistance to getting the books in your hands. And once the books are in your hands, then just go ahead and be fine taking little snacks from them. I completely agree. That 
his interview, which I actually wrote up and transcribed on my blog, would really help me to just buy books. Also, Ramit's thoughts about like, yo, if somebody recommends a book, just buy the book. All you need is one good idea for it to be worth the $15 that it costs. Yeah, Ryan Holiday also has that philosophy. I, hopefully, I'll be interviewing him soon for it. And I've tried to take on that philosophy as as well. It has become so many books that I, I do do the wish right. list sometimes. Um, and I, sometimes I'm traveling and I can't get the physical books to me. So doing it with Kindle, uh, I've found some ways it's not quite the same. But uh, yeah, for me, it was a... It was a long process, I think, but that was one of the starting points of it, I think, was you mentioning this uh, this library hack. And I don't really walk by a library very often, but I did like this idea of having a book in my hands um, and being comfortable with what I'll do is I'll just look at the table of contents and I'll mindfully think about what each of these chapters might be about. And if I wonder, I might go peek at the first uh, paragraph or two and I read it in layers as I as I call it um, I like that idea yeah I get the first layer and then sometimes there will be a chapter where I'm like oh that's the chapter that I want to read so let's go right to the middle of that I'll just go right to that chapter I'm gonna read that chapter and then really it's, a, it's up to the book to pull me in with its relevance you know I still the the counterintuitive thing is that doing this got me doing more reading where I actually do sit down and read linearly where okay enough little nuggets from a book have pulled in my curiosity that i want to read it cover to cover now and i can do so without having any sense of fomo or anything because i know that it's a good book that i want to read how cool would it be when people start to quote so now right like people quote so many articles on twitter and they like do those screenshots of highlighted things from articles wow I wonder when that'll start to happen with books, right? That'll be pretty interesting. Yeah, there's, I mean, you can do it a little bit with Kindle with for Kindle, iPad. Right? Yeah. Uh, I, it's, it's not very, yeah, it's not a very elegant process. I know there was a, a company that created a cool product that doesn't exist anymore called uh, Read Mill, and they were, I think, trying to get people to do more of that. But I've definitely found that as I'm, I highlight a ton Cool. in my Kindle, and I'll go back through the highlights just to, um, and I'll compile uh, it as, as research. I don't know if you've heard of the Commonplace book. That's a no. thing that Ryan Holiday does where he goes back through and will write on an index card different interesting things from books, and then he just has like a huge case full of index really? cards. Yeah, apparently it's a thing that uh, a number of people have done throughout history, Ronald Reagan being one of them. Uh, just carrying around a suitcase full of these index cards, full of different anecdotes and things like that. I've never heard of that before. I'll write it down. Called the Commonplace Book. Yeah, he's got an article about it. Uh, oh. it it's it's something that uh, I've experimented with because that's another thing is you you read a book and sometimes you forget the stuff. So this helps you get it into your head and the things that were that you, that were interesting to you like i i have this thing now where i just if i feel some sort of a tickle in my brain i just dog ear the page try to go back through and process it um one of my litmus tests is i want to be i will sit there and talk out loud uh and say and summarize the book because i i've been to too many cocktail parties okay. where i'm trying to tell somebody about a part when i'm trying to tell somebody yeah. about a book did yeah. this ever happen to you and you try to like oh this book's great and then somebody asks you what it's about, and then you realize you don't know, have any idea. Right, you, right, right. right. You're like, how do I explain this? No, I love that. I've never heard of somebody who, who talks out the book summary, but that is freaking genius. Well, yeah, and I might do that with the table of contents itself. Well, I might look at um, the, the title of a chapter and say, all right, what is that about? Maybe it's about yeah. this, and then I'll, no, I might even try to guess. Sometimes they have the cutesy chapter titles which make it difficult to tell what the chapter is about right um and then you just you go read the first paragraph you try to find there's there's one sentence in there that basically summarizes what that chapter is about and you just try to find it say yeah. it out loud and try to just summarize the argument of the whole book and it, it totally changes the relationship with the book and it you know and and you started it 
you started it for me, I think, with this this book reading hack of yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It definitely helped me read more books. I say that I'm I say that I'm a quitter for reading books, but I've read way more books than I do than I used to in the past. Yeah. You also got me going on using assistance. So I've experimented oh. a lot with that um, in different ways. Some some things have worked for me, some things have not. Um, what are some of the things that you use assistance for? I love to talk about virtual assistants. This is one of my favorite topics of conversation ever. You perked up. Yeah. Oh, man, I definitely perked up. Yeah. You know, it's kind of hard to talk about books, but, but like VAs, I'm down. I love to talk about this. I use fancy hands all the time. I used to use virtual. I use a service called Upwork to hire freelancers. For me, it helps me focus a little more on the things that I'm good at and frees up some of the daytime chores of my life. Are there any, like this hack of having them go through your wish list and put them on the the library, check them out from the library, that was golden. Do you have any other tidbits like that? I got one that I do. It, like whenever you have to go to a, a new website and you're shopping for something, right? I buy most of my stuff on Amazon, but if I'm buying something not on Amazon, I have to like create a new username and register and put in my credit card. Instead, I'll just send that to Fancy Hands and they'll just buy it for me. It's like 99 cents. Wait, now, and in, so my, the, in my experience, Fancy Hands, uh, they, they used to buy things for you and, and, and then for a while they weren't buying things for you anymore. Has that changed? It's back, back now. It works great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great to know. Yeah, I mean, I do that too. I, uh, I, or I used to do that with with my assistant where I just be, I just send it, send a link and say, please buy this, yep. use this credit card. And yeah, it saves, it's not so much the time, but it's just the cognitive yes. switching of typing in all this stuff that you typed in before right? and all of that. So yeah, that one's, that one's pretty good. Are there any other uh, recurring things that you have going that help things make things efficient for you? Um, That's a big one. I mean, the, the ones I've done most recently, I did one before we got on the call today. Find me a T-Mobile store that's open near this address where I'm going to dinner tonight um, and tell me how long it's open for. I've used virtual assistants to send flowers to my mother. I do that like pretty regularly. Um, I use virtual assistants to help me with my email messages. This is something that I do every single day that's just so helpful. It's the best part of my day. Wait, so with the email messages, how does that, how does, how does that, how do they help you with that? Um, so I go through my email box and I can like quickly sort my messages into different labels and I'll be able to pick some that like take a little bit of work to write back or things that I need to schedule or help with. And then once a day I get on the phone with one of my VAs, it's usually a woman named Nadia, uh, but sometimes Angel or Carly and they log into my email and I walk around my neighborhood with a Bluetooth headset on and I say, read me my emails. Let's, let's go through these and start to reply back to them. Okay. So you get to kind of walk and talk and get a little exercise and maybe your, your brain operates differently as you are walking and talking than when you sit in front of your computer and type perhaps as well. Yeah, I think I've just gotten older. I don't have as much, I'm not as good as like focusing and like dealing with stuff. Or maybe I just have the luxury now to like choose to have somebody else help me with that. But yeah, I don't really like do emails like I used to. And I get a lot of them. So this is just so, it's so cool. I can just walk around and they'll read me the message. I say, all right, here's what I need to do. Write back to them, say this send this calendar invite, follow up with this person, let's go to the next. And in like an hour, we get so much done. It's the best part of my day. Yeah, I think that, as you mentioned, like getting older, I think that there's some sort of progression that happens as you get into a little bit more of a managerial role, perhaps that's part of it, is mm -hmm. that your brain is operating on this one cognitive layer and there's this other cognitive layer of typing things and deciding exactly what sentences to say when you're really just, just, just the general idea is, is right. what needs to happen. And right. 
they help reduce some of that extra cognitive overhead, I guess. Yeah, it, it certainly helps. And I also like email back faster, but much shorter and curt. And I think some people that can come off across as very rude. But for me, I just assume somebody would prefer to have a fast reply than a like very polite reply. Right. And I, I've also gotten some really uh, great birthday wishers from you on Facebook. Oh, like a shit. Video Are you about to such. blow up my Facebook game? Oh, okay. I mean, if, we don't, if you don't want to talk about that, we can uh, we No, can that's not, all right. But that's it's all right. pretty cool. I, right. I found it very inspiring. So, I do use virtual assistants um, like my colleague Ernesto and some others to help me send birthday greetings to my friends, especially on Facebook. And that's very helpful. See, so I, I, I sense a little bit of um, maybe fear of judgment for something like that. Or, and I, I'll go ahead and admit something too. That's inspired me. I put in my uh, shortcuts on my iPhone. Just if I type HPB, it will type happy birthday with an exclamation point. Oh, so if that's I go smart. on yeah, so if I go on Facebook, I like I think that just ty- simply typing happy birthday is is less ideal than what I would like to do, but it is but it's way better. It's a thousand percent better than than nothing. Like it's the if if the thought if it's the thought that counts, then you know, this should be just fine. So I'll go through and on the wall. But I have considered looking through a month in advance and saying, all right, these these are the folks that I, I want to wish happy birthday to and having somebody else wish it. I mean, it's it, it's funny because I sense in myself a little bit of a fear of judgment of doing that because something about it seems unsavory. <laughs> or, But it's really, if you think about that, you know, we used to go buy a card and then you write the card right. and then you send it and then somebody opens it and it's a different time. You're still putting in a certain type type of effort and a person is getting it at a particular, at a different time than when you're putting in the effort. It's not really a whole lot. Di- you're, you're wishing them happy birthday at least. <laughs> right, right. We're wishing them happy birthday. I feel that I feel that common thread with you that you're hesitant to do something like that, that you're hesitant to kick people out of your apartment. Hmm, yeah, and yeah. yeah. And I don't know what to say about that besides maybe that's like the New Yorker that's in me that's like whenever I go home to the suburbs in North Georgia, someone will be like at a a green light and not moving. And I'll be like, Mom and Dad, honk the horn at this person. Are you kidding me? And they're like, no, we don't honk here. It's like very polite. Maybe they're working on something. That's an, that's a, and, an astute observation, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've, I'm just like, well, I've, I've spent a month in New York a couple different times and, and I do like that, um, you know, that it's acceptable to go ahead and, you know, if somebody's in your, I guess I haven't really done a whole lot of New Yorker type things, but you can just, you there's this understanding that you can, that there's a, a finite amount of time and there's a finite amount of space and there are a lot of people and, and get the, the niceties out of the way. I mean, having grown up in Nebraska, right. uh, my brain's maybe wired a little bit differently from how I, it might be if I had lived in New York for a ex- more extended period of time. I think this thing happens, this like this abruptness or this like lack of patience happens in all major big cities to people who just get, you know, there's a lot going on. Like this happens to, to busy people. We got shit to do. Like, let's keep rolling, keep our eye on the bigger picture. Yeah. It's it's funny. I don't think that there's anything wrong with it myself, but I just, uh, it's the, this imagined idea that somebody else thinks that there's something wrong with it that it sometimes holds me back. And it's something that I yeah. try not to let hold me back because actually if the internet has done anything, it has taught me that it, it, it's almost like there's so much criticism out there. I'm not saying necessarily criticism against me personally, but there's so much criticism that is so hair trigger that eventually it's like the boy who cried wolf and it, you can't take any mm-hmm. of it seriously. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is, it, it's hard, right? I was talking to a friend about this the other day. He's like, man, there are people who wake up and they get on the internet and they're just looking for a fight. And if you let them determine who you are or what message you share, then they've won, right? Yeah. Was, were, were those imaginary critics in your head at all as you were? Oh, no, no. Dude, we have very real critics. To... Oh, yeah, very real critics. Okay. No, well... no, no, dude. We have people who hate what we do. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. We're trying to shake up the museum world. And there are people entrenched in these old ways. And many times they have very valid arguments about what we're doing. And, and it's been interesting to think about those as we grow our business. So some of it, yeah, sometimes it's a really val valid thing that makes you think differently about the way that you approach things. Yeah, and, for sure. And other times it's, it's okay, this person sees it differently or is is insane and there, it doesn't matter yes definitely uh well so those critics are real but were the imaginary critics there when you were struggling with deciding to charge i guess the imaginary critics were there i don't know i'm not really one to like pay too much attention to that type of stuff um Okay. I won't say I don't worry. Yeah. They don't yeah, say I don't worry or like think about other people, but we won't even bother with it then any, yeah. any further. Um, one thing that is interesting to me that I think might be interesting to a lot of the people who are listening is that you're doing this thing that doesn't scale super easily, right. right? You're doing this like curated museums. When you first started this, were you, did you, did that bother you at all that like, oh, is this going to be, can this be big enough to be a business? I definitely have a chip, or not a chip on my shoulder, but I'm jealous of a lot of my friends. I know you had Jonathan Wagner on here from Time Hop yeah. recently. We have other friends who have very successful, scalable software companies. And this business is never going to be that, right? It's human powered and it doesn't grow easily, but I'm so lucky to do it. I feel like we're making a difference in this little museum world, and I love doing it. I get to work with some of the most talented people I've ever met, these creative presenters. So I like what I'm doing. I'm happy with the trade-off. What's the biggest compromise that you've made in building this business? The biggest compromise I've made in building the business is less alcohol. <laughs> Um, our tours used to involve a lot more drinking and alcohol and which is just a real, just real talk, right? It's like we would attract people with the idea, like we're going to go drink wine in the cafe and drink a lot of it and go have fun in the museum. And that, that was such a major shift for our business when we had to like get away from that to be like slightly more sober that everybody thought we were going to fail. People thought it was not going to work. And there were just major drama that was around that. And it's worked out. It's worked out very well. I mean, we're much, much larger than we used to be. One of those things that you have to do to get a little bit more rigorous and professional after you make that commitment. For sure. For sure. Yeah, I feel like I gave a bad answer about a compromise. I don't know. It's <laughs> a tough alcohol. question. It stumps a lot of people. Well, you can, yeah. if you got any others, go for it. The one thing was when I switched from being the like provider of the tours where all the tours were led by me and then I started to like my friends would help and I'd hire other people. People told me, even my best friends, nobody's going to do this. They only come for you. Like, like you are the product and if I were to listen to them, I would be nowhere near the size we are today. But thankfully, I hired amazing people that are way better than I am. And now I haven't led formal tours in a very long time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so you don't even give the tours anymore yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah. When have you left money on the table? That's a good question. I'm, I'm thinking about it. One interesting thing is these wedding proposal tours, these guys who have the craziest requests when they want to propose to a girlfriend. And we don't charge too much for them, but I get the impression that 
several of them have like unlimited budgets um, because they want this moment to be memorable for the rest of their lives. Uh, so we probably leave a little money on the table for those. Our corporate clients, right? We don't exactly know how much people pay for storytelling workshops and things like that. I think I definitely leave money on the table there. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you think that you get in exchange for leaving that money on the table? We hope that we're always selling a fair product. We're never trying to rip somebody off. We have expensive museum tours. Our nighttime tours are $89 a piece per person. Mm -hmm. But those tours actually are like our lowest margin tours. They include a nice glass of wine, multiple tour guides, full fair admission to the museum, extremely small groups. Um, so yeah, we hope we're just trying to be fair to people. What was the last book that you read that changed the way that you saw something? I love the book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. I know everybody's talking about it from a business perspective, but I read it at a place in my life where I had to make some hard decisions about a real business. And if you have a company with employees or with contractors, I really recommend that book. Oh, it's funny. I haven't actually had that book recommended to me before. Oh, wow. Is, is Very there any key takeaways. Oh, man. He went through, um, Horowitz went through just some hell with this company, LoudCloud, around 2001, 2002, and basically took it from being weeks away from out of cash after the dot-com bust to selling it for like more than a billion dollars. And it is the story of a fighter, of somebody who when you're faced with no decision or a very hard decision, uh, how you choose between those two. Um, I think I read it two or three times when I was going through some stuff. Wow. Yeah. Do you make your bed? Thank you for asking. I make my bed every day. Okay. You're the first guest so far. Really? Who <laughs> makes their bed. Yeah. Which yeah, I was surprised by because I had heard from so many different sources that making your bed is just like, oh, if there's one habit that you can take, it's making your bed. Have you always been a bed maker? I, yeah, as long as I know. I mean, I can't, like, how long does it take? Also, for those of you who don't make your bed, what do you, like, crawl into at the end of the day? Do you, it, it just sounds like I don't understand how that works. I'm a former non-bed maker. Uh-huh. So... I think it's just like a pile of sheets and then they get kind of twisted up and you just throw them around until it yeah. resembles something that you can crawl into. It's so fast. It's so easy. My friend Josh Abramson told me that he makes his bed every day because he immediately knows that he did something like he did something. He can look at his bed within a minute of waking up and be like, I did that. I woke up and I made my bed and yeah. like now today is starting out great. Yeah, it has a. I think it can have a powerful effect on your self perception and and confidence in a way that you did something. You can see the results of it, which a lot of things we do throughout the day sometimes you don't see the results. Right. And you, yeah, you start out your your day that way. Here's how I make my bed. By the way, when I'm laying down in my bed, right, I'm I'm still like just waking up. I kind of start very quickly to straighten out the covers. And so I kind of like flare the sheets to kind of straighten it out. And then I more or less like jump up. I stand up inside my bed and I flare the sheets again and just line it all up and just like pull the sheets down to my feet and then just hop off the bed. And I really could probably make my bed in eight seconds. I think I do it similarly now. Uh, I, I previously for a while there, though, I would fold the sheets under the mattress did you oh, do that at all no 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 mine is like a very bachelor make my bed in like eight seconds i'm looking at it now and it's like it doesn't look perfect by any means but it's not like a huge mound of stuff yeah i got that change uh the change came about when i interviewed jason freed and he said oh i just i throw the bed and then it made me realize that actually i, I hate being in like a hotel made bed where they uh -huh. tuck the sheets under and you've got to kick them out. Right. And so just eliminate that. But I still get, I still get the nice clean look because I, yeah. I work from home. So I see the bed. Right. And if I see the bed while I'm working and it's this disorganized thing, it's going to affect my, my performance. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm kind of the same way about the kitchen at my apartment. It's like got to be relatively clean. Yeah. Did you ever experience resistance to making your bed when you were a kid? I don't know the answer to that. I can't, I can't really like remember. I feel like I'm a very clean individual. Sometimes they ask you that like, Oh, could you ever date someone who wasn't clean? I don't, I don't know really. I was highly resistant. I thought, really? I, did, I thought it didn't make any sense at all. Yeah. Making yeah. your bed. But you know, oh, one thing I do that's kind of weird, actually, is if I'm staying at a hotel room and I will have like had a nap in the hotel or something like midday it, so, and I leave the hotel and they don't have turn down service, then I'll actually kind of make my bed up a little bit within the hotel so that when I come back to the room later that day, the bed's made. Yeah. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons I love being on a cruise ship because they make your bed three times a day. It's amazing. Do you mess up your bed three times a day on a cruise ship? Dude, of course. Dude, of course. What else do I do on a cruise? I eat, I work out, I sleep, and I read like all nonstop throughout the day. There's naps happening. You're sleeping in. They're doing turn down service. It's awesome. I've never been on a cruise and I just always assume that it's totally not my thing. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what do you like okay. about cruises? I feel like I don't want to. I feel like I'm alienating myself with you and with your other listeners that like no people. Yeah, first I like museums. Now I like cruises. Great, this guy's crazy. Well, I like museums too. All right, cool. So cruises is a way to feel like you're living in a big city with unlimited food, gym locations. It's just like so convenient, and you get to travel. I get so – there's no place I get so much reading done as being on a cruise. That's the number one place I get reading oh, done. Oh, that's awesome. Yep. I did a huge cruise recently from Vancouver, Canada to Tokyo, Japan. That was awesome. Oh, okay. I think I remember seeing seeing that as like a, a thing that I could potentially have joined on, but I regrettably didn't. It was awesome. It sounded like it was awesome. Do you have a final message for any of our listeners out there who are trying to carve out their own definition of success? When I started Museum Hack, I never thought that I wanted to make a business. I wanted to create the very best museum tour for my friends. And so creating something for my friends that was designed to be the very best in the world. And I did it. I practiced it every weekend, multiple times, multiple tours every weekend so I could be so good at it and get real feedback from people before I started to charge for it. For me, I know not, not everybody has that luxury of doing so much practice, but that certainly helped me in my success with Museum Hack. I can totally relate to that. It's actually a blog post that's been going in my head as I worked on this uh on this podcast, actually the gen- the thing that got me to actually finally start the podcast after years of thinking about it was somebody who wrote a post about how easy it is to run a podcast. Turns out if you are really, really detail oriented and you really love podcasts and you really want it to be really good, it actually isn't right. quick and easy. It takes a long time. I spend like probably 10 hours per episode or something like wow. that because but it's it's fine but it's it's because i like it that much and i care that much about the quality of it that you know just like for example for you you know i like listen to other interview other podcast interviews of you you know i think right. about what is it about nick and then i go through the audio and all that stuff and and taking a lot of time almost like an unreasonable amount of time on it and there's something very gratifying about it mm-hmm. and there's something about that is very different from what seems to be the prevailing uh, wisdom online about optimizing the hell out of everything and A-B testing because you're not really sure all right. the time. That is, I mean, you're a designer, right? Like you're a, you're a writer, you're a designer. Like you have a very curatorial view of the world and the stuff that 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 you produce is controlled and you care about it. Yeah, that's that's a, a useful observation, and maybe it's one that I sometimes forget myself because I'm me. Yeah, that's why well, we love you. Well, that oh, thank you. 
Well, actually, that, that makes me. I was just about to wrap up, but that does make me think. Are there were there any things about yourself that you've gotten to know over the years that there were sort of uh, observations people made that trigger you to to notice something about yourself that is now in a part of what you do? I'm working on my empathy and my connection with other people just as much as that big city attitude of lack of patience can be a strength. It can also really be a weakness to not really take the time to understand. As entrepreneurs, we tend to be very self-centered and focused on our own goals about things. And as I've grown my business now, it's not about me being an individual contributor. It's about my team. And so it's been a hard learning process for me. No, that's, I'm still learning. That's, that's funny to me because it seems like you put so much uh, empathy or thought about the other person into these interactions that might not normally have it. Like a Facebook, yeah. you know, a Facebook uh, birthday message from you is sometimes a video where you're – speaking to me directly or right, you know right. like your twitter there's you have a public twitter then you have like a private twitter you have a friend's email list right, that right. you send stuff just to friends mm -hmm. um it's you you have this space in things that in mediums that sometimes make it difficult for a depth of interaction you find a way sometimes to increase that depth of interaction and i guess that extends not only is not only in the museums, but also in these things like, you know, you've got your private Twitter, you've got your public Twitter and right, um, right. things like that. So thank you for acknowledging that, that. I try. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely part of it for sure. Oh, and but I, I've just been, I yeah. thought maybe it was just like a natural thing for you, but it's something that you consciously work on. It is natural. Yeah. But I'm more talking about um, decisions in work or like, uh, I got this feedback. This is uncomfortable to share, but I got feedback from an ex-girlfriend who said, my best friends have hung out with you four times and they don't really know anything about you beyond like icebreakers. And that level of like superficial kind of interaction is comes very easy to me because I facilitate so many group things. But for me to drop my guard and really get real with somebody, I very much close that off. And to people, that tends to be a big warning sign or they don't trust that if they can't see that. And so that's something that I'm working on hmm. is like just being a little more authentic sometimes. Yeah, I, I think I've I've gotten similar feedback before uh in in the past and it's something that uh i don't know it, it can be facilitated by the way that we are in this technology world where you have lots of weaker connections mm -hmm. but the, yeah there's ways if you're conscious about it as you as you know to make a few a few connections that right. are a little deeper right you have to be conscious about it you gotta watch it i've before. been been going through some hard times at work. This is one of our slowest months and people will ask me like, Hey, what's up? How are things going? And I'll be honest. I'll be like, Oh man, it's, it's been a tough few weeks and people are really caught off guard by that yeah. because they're just trying to do small talk. And for me, that's like a little way of like showing vulnerability when I'm like ready to get real a little bit. I'm like, very very okay with sharing that sometimes and it really catches people off guard i'm still figuring out the best way to do that have you ever tried that with uh a clerk at say the grocery store no <laughs> not the grocery store i try to make their their days great give them a compliment ask right. them how their day is going thank them for coming in stuff like that when they say how are you you just say fine That's if they great. say no no if they say how are the how am i yeah. I'm doing great. Wow, I'm so happy to be here. The store is awesome. Thanks for coming in today and right. serving me. I came into this place and there was just all this food here and I could just right. grab it. And like, <laughs> I, what could I complain about? Right, right. Um, where can our listeners find more of you? Or I, your company? Or how would you like for them to continue contact? 
uh, send me a tweet. If you're listening to this right now and you liked anything about it, uh, please tweet at me and let me know because I'd love to know what you connected with. On Twitter, I am Nick Gray News, N-E-W-S, Nick Gray News. Um, I'd love to hear from you. The name of my company is Museum Hack. We're in New York City, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco. We do the world's best museum tours. And if you come on a tour and you don't like it, like no joke, I'll give you all of your money back. If it's not an amazing experience, you can have all your money back. I know it's kind of expensive, but we live and live and die by that satisfaction guarantee. That is fantastic. And thank you so much, Nick, for coming on and having this conversation. Uh, hopefully sometime we can do it uh, again in person. I can't wait. Thanks for doing this podcast, for putting in the love and care that you do to each episode and the interviews. I really appreciate that. I appreciate you acknowledging that. I, I really do put a, a lot of love into it. And so it means a lot to hear that somebody's recognizing that. Thanks. <laughs> So there we have it. Before I go, I got to ask, do you like books? If you do, I'd love to send you my book recommendations. About 90% of them will be nonfiction on subjects spanning from biographies to neuroscience. Just go to academy.net slash reading, sign up, and you'll get my first set of recommendations right away. You'll be supporting the show if you buy any of those books through the links in the email. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is CNU, performed by The Album Leaf, courtesy of Sub Pop Records. Love Your Work is a production of Academy Inc.